So I've been thinking about how I want to start this series on Seminar 18. And my temptation, as some of you know, is to begin with this wild little radio address called Radio Phony. As you know, Lacan dips from Seminar 17 to go record some writing in audio format that's going to be played on the Belgian radio. There's this passage in particular in this wild little piece that I want to share with you. It's on page 15 of the standard English translation of this essay slash radio address, which you can find readily online. And it reads as follows. You may know this passage. It's a wild passage, and it's tempting to begin our series on 18 with this. The unconscious one sees is only a metaphoric term in designating the knowledge that only sustains itself in presenting itself as impossible, so that from that it is confirmed as being real, to be understood real discourse. Now the part that I really like about this is this bit about presenting itself as impossible. The unconscious is a field of knowledge that doesn't just exist as the impossible, but also finds expression in presentations of itself as impossible. Presenting itself as impossible. Such that in these presentations of itself as impossible, it is confirmed as being real, which makes its presentations, as I read this passage, examples of real discourse. Now you may be wondering, why in the hell, McCormick, would you want to begin the series on 18 with this passage from this wild and wacky radio phoning address? A passage that has been bewildering Lacanians for a long time. Why start there, bro? Well, the reason why I would start there is because I believe in this passage we get a tentative preliminary answer to the question, what the fuck? And that question, what the fuck, is usually the question that I begin all readings of Lacan seminars with. I love where he begins. I also find it tremendously frustrating sometimes. This title of the 1971 seminar that we're going to be looking at, Seminar 18, on a discourse that might not be a semblance. It's an interesting one. Modus ponens, you heard him mention in the opening chapters of this discourse. What exactly is a discourse that might not be a semblance? Well, first and foremost, what we have to know is that if there might be a discourse that's not a semblance, the presumption here the implication, modus ponens, is that most, if not all discourse, that we have encountered to date is a semblance. Master, hysteric, university, analyst, capitalist, the list could and should go on. Sometimes even in spite of what Lacan says. These are discourses that demonstrate that discourse is a semblance. Which brings us to Seminar 18. Could there be a discourse that is not a semblance? And if so, what kind of discourse would this be? How would it operate? What would be its basic structural operators? That's why it's tempting to begin with that passage from Radiophony. A discourse that might not be a semblance, hear me now, would be a real discourse. Not the discourse of the analyst, although it's close. Certainly not the discourse of the master, which is the other side of the discourse of the analyst. Not contrary, correlative. Not an antinomy, but a torsion, like on a Mobius strip of the discourse of the analyst. You see, the master exists on a Mobius strip with the analyst. And the same is true of the university and the hysteric. You also read that right in the opening chapter here on Seminar 18. But the point I want to make here is that there may be 
a discourse of the real in addition to these four classic Lacanian discourses. That is what I'm suggesting here in starting with radiophony. That there may be a discourse that succeeds in presenting the impossible, which for Lacan at this point is in his thought, as you heard us say in our previous series on Seminar 17, it's all over Seminar 17. The impossible for Lacan here means the real. But for us, in the field of discourse formations that Lacan has now entered into, what matters is the presentification, as he sometimes says, of the impossible. It's not the real that interests him here. It's the name of the real. It's not the real father that interests him here. It's the name of the real father, if you recall our stuff on Seminar 17. It's the statement. It's the declaration. It's the signification of the real in the symbolic, using the symbolic that interests him. And this, as we're going to see, is also why he is queuing up truth in the opening chapters of Seminar 18. Now, I don't think that truth is equivalent to the real, but they are closely connected in Lacan's theory of discourse. And part of our challenge in getting started here is to draw out this connection, but also in so doing to mark some of these differences. Truth can also be presented. It also passes through the defiles of the signifier. It also can find expression, but only ever partially. And the partial expression of truth usually only ever says just that. Here I find my limits. Beyond this I can go no further. Here is yet another presentation of the impossible. So let's just jump right in then and talk about what Lacan means by discourse. Now I'm guessing if you've made it this far with lectures on Lacan, that you've also studied Seminar 16 and watched our series on 16, that you've studied Seminar 17 and watched our series on Seminar 17. I don't want to assume all of that, but these three seminars are species of the same kind. I would suggest that what we have here is a discursive turn in Lacan's thought culminating in Seminar 17 with this four-footed animal, a topology, a structure that Lacan understands as discourse. And I want to draw it. I want you to draw it. Some of you are going to be listening to this lecture. Some of you are going to be watching it as I'm recording it, audio and visual channels popping. All of us can imagine discourse. Let's bring it into focus. Get a sheet of paper. Grab a sheet of paper. It doesn't have to be a big sheet of paper. What I do is I tear sheets of paper into squares and then use these for little notes, as you've seen. On this sheet of paper, draw a horizontal line. I don't know, maybe an inch long. And then next to this horizontal draw line, draw another so that it looks something like this. You've got two horizontal lines side by side. Now, Above the first horizontal line, write the word agent. Below the first horizontal line, write the word truth. This is going to be where Lacan wants to focus in the early sections of Seminar 18. This key relationship between agency and truth. The conscious, willing ego that speaks and addresses another, the agent, and the underlying unconscious structure that is this agent's cause. Now, with that other line that you drew, above that second line, write other. And below the second line, write production. And then, because we want to keep fleshing this model out, Draw an arrow from agent pointing to other. 
At this point, what you have is the basic topology of discourse, according to Lacan. All discourse is going to have this four-footed, four-legged structure where you have an agent addressing another. That's what that arrow means. And what comes from that address is a production, a gain or a loss. Something is produced by that address. And so what you could add is another arrow coming around the side, pointing from other down to production. An agent addresses someone and something is produced. So if you take a basic example of lordship and bondage, the Lord commands the bondsman to bake him a cake. Agent commands the other to produce an edible artifact, a cake. That's what's produced. Very basic, very simple. The relation to truth is the more important one you heard me say. And here's how I would frame it at this point. Draw another arrow from truth pointing up to the agent so that you know that this agent doesn't just pop out of nowhere. This agent has an origin, an origin or a cause, an underlying structure that conditions its very possibility. That is truth. So, if you study the discourse of the master, which despite what Lacan says is absolutely the focal discourse in these seminars. Now it's true that the discourse of the analyst is the original primordial discourse out of which the other three classic Lacanian discourses, master, hysteric, and university spin. He says that very clearly in seminar 20, almost as though he's trying to set the record straight. Because so many people probably went up to him and they were like, bro, so the master's discourse comes first, right? Because there were masters around long before there were psychoanalysts. And Lacan's like, well, you know, this ain't a historical argument I'm making. It's a logical, structural, conceptual argument with clinical implications. It's the discourse of the analyst when theorized that allows us to think and conceptualize the other three discourses. Nevertheless, Lacan lavishes attention on the discourse of the master. The discourse of the master, which, hear me now, is the other side of psychoanalysis. The inverse of the analytic discourse, and the very reason why he titled Seminar 17 what he did, the other side of psychoanalysis, is because it's a seminar about the fucking master's discourse. The other side of psychoanalysis is mastery. And all of the delusions and ignorant phenomena that come with that, which we've discussed in our previous series. But here, the point I want to make is that in the discourse of the master, you see this master signifier S1 popping in the position of the agent. And in the position of truth, you see this classic Lacanian notion of a barred subject. This classic Lacanian phenomenon known as the subject. And the subject for Lacan, we learn in Seminar 17, is the living individual who has been bored through, cut through, arcaded, furrowed, opened up by the signifier. The living individual, according to Lacan, is the locus or the site in which the effects of signification can be housed in which they are housed, in which they are traced and subsequently effaced. The living individual is the house of the being of language, according to Lacan. And the subject is what results. The subject is this reciprocally constituted grammatical and enunciating agency. And torn in between, because where two or more have gathered, you always got this third thing that is their break, that is their disrelation, their disidentification. The subject is barred and multiple as a result. That's the truth of the master's discourse. The master thinks they just command and the world obeys. What they don't realize is that they too, in other words, are effect structures of language. 
And as a result, they are not just these conscious, intentional, controlling, omnipotent beings in the world, but instead just as unconscious, just as inscribed by signification as we are. Now, I cue this up because it's also at the very start of Seminar 18. Seriously, you can just read the first couple of pages and you'll see Lacan walking you through this structure of the subject within the structure of discourse. The point I want to make here is that that unconscious truth of barred subjectivity is a structuring force, the condition of possibility for the master's position as agent. That's what's up here. So you have these three arrows that constitute Lacan's theory of discourse. Agents address others and some things are produced. There are those arrows. But you also have a truth, unconscious, that structures the very agency that the master, the university, the hysteric, and even the analyst would occupy, would activate. Which brings us to the question, if you've got truth leading to agent, leading to other, leading to production, can we then draw an arrow from production back to truth and complete the circle? Because Lord knows we love a complete circle. Lacan's answer categorically is no. Between truth and production, there is only a barrier, a logical obstacle, an impasse beyond which one can go no further. In Seminar 17, Lacan represents this impasse or this barrier, this logical obstacle between truth and production with this little triangle, this little delta, which I would suggest is a relative of the lozenge that you would see in other Lacanian mathemes, since we're talking about the master, not least of which is the mathem of fantasy. Look at the master's discourse, and you'll see where the fantasy he can't handle is. Take a look at the analyst's discourse, and you'll see how it brings the master into contact with that fantasy. Now, I'm being elusive here, again, assuming that you've read 16, that you've studied 17, and maybe that you've also seen our series on these two seminars, as we find ourselves here at the start of Seminar 18. The point that I want to make, though, is that if you're imagining this drawing that we've done, if you've done it yourself, if you're watching the video and you can see the diagram I'm holding up, no problem. If you need help finding these passages, review our series on 17. We talk through the passages in Seminar 17 where Lacan develops this barrier. That's the point I want to make. Truth conditions agent, agent addresses other, their discourse results in something produced, and between the production of their discourse and the truth, there can be no relation. There is a non-rapport there. There is a breakdown of sorts. This delta is a delta of what Lacan refers to as impotence. Between production and the truth that was the origin of the address that resulted in that production, there is only impotence. Now you can think about this in each of the discourses and come up with a pretty clear indication, basic though it may be, of why this delta is there. Why there is this impossibility between truth and production. Think, for instance, about the discourse of the university. The agent here is knowledge, or S2, that addresses the curiosity of the students, here designated by objet A, and what results is the production of a barred subjectivity, a subjectivity that doesn't know much, that may only know, in fact, that they're quite ignorant of very many things. This, in short, is a student whose mind is blown by the course content. They have studied, they have read, they have learned a lot in this class. But one of the things that they have learned more than any other is that they don't know everything. 
that their knowledge, in other words, is limited. This barred subjectivity that is the production of the university discourse is also segregated, divided, sundered from the truth of the university discourse, which is what? Yes, you see S1 in the position of truth in the university discourse, which it's very easy to say shows that the capitalist is in fact the one who is behind the professor. In other words, that the professor doesn't realize this basic Marxian truth that they are simply the mouthpieces for power. The philosopher is the mouthpiece for power, which is precisely, again, what Lacan means when he refers back to Marx. He doesn't say as much, but he wants this Marxist critique of intellectual and university life to be forefront. I wish that Lacan had slowed down and really spelled this out, because if you read Marx carefully, you can hear him realizing the discourse of the university, especially in the relationship between truth and agency, where the agency of the professor belies an institutionally unconscious truth, a collectively unconscious truth, namely that it's the state that cuts the university's salaried checks every month. I'm an employee, technically speaking, of the state of California. The state of California cuts my checks at the end of each month. Now, that doesn't put me in league with the capitalist. We broke as fuck out here. We public educators. But it shows that part and parcel of the work I do as a professor is this underlying truth that it's the capitalist, it's the state who's paying my bills. Now, I don't want to be too wishy-washy in associating governmental occupants and officiants with capitalists, but often that's exactly what we see. you got to be rich to play politics. The point that I want to make here around the discourse of the university is that that S1 in the lower position cues up this Marxist insight that the ruling ideas in any given era are always the ideas of the ruling class in that era. That tells you how S2 and S1 work together in the university discourse. The ruling ideas, the ideas propounded, professed by the intellectual elites of any given era. They are only ever fancily worded statements of the ideas that prop up the wealth and the power of the ruling elites in any given era. That's straight out of Marx. That's some classic Marxian insight critique of standard intellectual culture. Kant is really the first university professor. Marx comes along and is kind of like, you know, ragtagging about. But nevertheless, he's seeing university professors. He knows what the fuck he's talking about. In a way that the great inventor of critique, Immanuel Kant, didn't quite see yet. But Marx, critical Marxists, fundamentally understand this about universities, that the master is always pulling the strings of the professor, to some extent. That is not, however, the point I want to make here. That point that you've just heard me outline is very standard. You can read it in my first book, Letters to Power. This is one of the basic arguments in that book, is working through that Marxist insight around university culture. The point I want to make is something a little different, because I'm trying to illustrate that barrier between production and truth in any given discourse. In the discourse of the university, what's produced, you heard me say, is an ignorant, self-conscious, barred subject known as a student who has had their mind blown by a class and fully realizes that they've learned something but that they certainly don't know at all. In other words, they are able to state their limits. Very important part of this process of identifying this barrier between production and truth. Now, if you've got the diagram in front of you, keep your eyes focused on this thing so you can see how this plays out. Between truth and production, there is no go-between. In the case of the discourse of the university, what this shows 
is that the mastery of knowledge that the professor presumes is denied to the student whose mind is blown by the professor's class. So for the professor, as S2, to occupy the position of agent in the discourse of the university, this presumes another relation to S1, a mastery of knowledge that would have occurred through various credentials, trainings, degrees. Just go to your professor's office and you'll see what I'm talking about here. You walk into the office and there are all kinds of like awards on the wall. There are all kinds of diplomas on the wall. Listen, I'm not impervious to this shit. I got to also hang my stuff up somewhere. I also got to put my books somewhere. But you walk into a professor's office. You walk into my office and this is what you'll see. Three walls just full of books, floor to ceiling. Look at all that knowledge. Look at all that mastery. And you could, you know, dare a student grab one of these books off the wall and I'll tell you what it's about. Open the page or discuss it. I'll, demo, I'll show you the master. And then you've got all these other trappings of intellectual life. The awards, the diplomas, the fancy shit, the baubles from all over the world. Look at Freud's office. Look at all the baubles he had on his desk. All the trappings of linguistic and cultural capital that you heard me discuss in previous series that I believe are disastrous for analytic technique. But I ain't that kind of doctor, so I don't put too much weight in my insights around what could or could not be disastrous for analytic technique. The point I'm making here is that another way to read that S1 is as a mastery of knowledge, signaled by all of the trappings of linguistic and cultural capital that you see in the professor's office. One basic way to understand this barrier, this impotence between the student who's had their mind blown and this mastery of knowledge atop which the university professor sits. Look at the discourse. The university professor as agent sits atop a mastery of knowledge that he or she presumes as their truth. Another way to read this S1. The implication here is that the student ain't never going to get that. The professor remains in charge because the student's minds are always blown to such an extent that they realize, oh my God, I'll never catch up with that. Look at all the mastery and the insights that this professor brings. Look at the S1 atop which they sit, the mastery of knowledge. And then here I am having completed a class. Holy shit. And so you get this kind of like social hierarchy between the philosopher and the people. And this is where Marx fundamentally fails. Because Marx and many subsequent Marxists, think Lenin here for example, think that tradition of the intellectual elite, the vanguard class, that would take it upon themselves to educate, speak for, rally, mobilize the downtrodden, downwardly mobile, backbroken workers. This split in orthodox Marxism between the intellectual elites that would lead the party and all of the people who would make up the party, the workers that are too tired and busy to really do all the intellectual work that needs to happen in order for the revolution to occur, this is a social hierarchy within Marxism that Marxism doesn't often acknowledge. It's also the reason why the Communist Manifesto is a tiny little book. You see, workers ain't got time to read Capital, volumes <laughs> 1 through 35. Workers ain't got time for that shit. They got to have a manifesto, a Communist Manifesto, and it better be pocket size because that's all they have time for. You see, you see this hierarchy? The Marxist critique is that the philosopher is in the pocket of power, but the Marxist truth behind that critique is that the philosopher, the Marxist intellectual that's coming up with these insights, positions themselves as the authority over the people. Now, if you've read work by Jacques Ranciere and traditions coming out of Althusser, but Ranciere is definitely the best, you can read his Knights of Labor, his Proletarian Knights book, his one of his first big books, and you'll see all the cool shit that workers have done after hours. They paint, baby. They write poetry. They develop theory. 
They do all kinds of great shit with musical instruments. They're artists, they're thinkers, they're theorists after work. I know some people who are probably on this call who are in the exact same position. Motherfuckers working in factories, motherfuckers working in steel, motherfuckers working day jobs that then go home and study Lacan. Don't tell me these people need an intellectual elite to lead them into the revolution, intellectual, political, economic, and otherwise. They don't need that shit. What they need is time. And that's the truth of Marx's thought. It's fundamentally about lowering the amount of time everybody has to spend at work so that you can be free as everyone with money, with power, with time to engage in art, poetry, philosophy, theory, and the like. The point here is that Marx suffers from a dilemma of his own relative to the people. And that is also what you see being played out in the discourse of the university. The student is never allowed access to the mastery of knowledge atop which the professor sits. And as a result, you have this hierarchy between the student produced by the masterful class and the professor at the helm of that class. And that social hierarchy remains. This is what you can do when you understand the barrier between production and truth in Lacan's theory of discourse. I just chose the university for the fuck of it. I don't got notes on that. This is what you're looking at here, people. You could choose any of the discourses. You can study this barrier and you can make a lot of it, which is why I want to emphasize it. It's not usually something you see popping in Lacanian discussions of what he means by discourse. But I think this barrier is crucial, especially crucial here at the start of Seminar 18, when we're trying to understand a discourse that might not be a semblance. A discourse that might not be a semblance that could present itself as the impossible. My question is, where might that presentation occur? Where might the expression of impossibility find itself in a theory of discourse? And I believe emphasizing this notion of the barrier between truth and production in every Lacanian discourse is a start in this direction. You'll also note, however, that this is not where Lacan starts Seminar 18. Lacan starts Seminar 18 with the discourse of the master. Yeah, the analyst is there, but it's really the discourse of the master that has his attention. And you just heard me say that part of the reason why he does this is because the discourse of the master is the focal discourse as he's thinking through discourse. How on earth, why on earth is the focal discourse in Lacan's discourse theory from the late 60s to the early 70s, the discourse of the master? If you've seen our series on 16 and 17, you know why. And the reason why is this. There you are. You're entering the lecture hall. You're the 700th person. Where are you going to sit? And how is Lacan going to have enough bumper stickers for everyone? Throughout this period, the bumper sticker of Lacan's thought is the signifier is what represents the subject to or for another signifier. Like I said in our previous years, you probably heard me say this 300 times. Make it 301 times. I'm not just queuing this up because I'm a fan of that. Yes, on the back of my 2006 Hyundai Elantra, known as Moses, of course I have a bumper sticker that says the signifier is what represents the subject to or for another signifier. Psst. That and student driver, and you've got my car. This is what I do when I pass through the streets of San Francisco. I'm not making this shit up, though, for my own interest. This is where Lacan begins Seminar 18. The signifier being what represents a subject for another signifier, namely where the subject is not. This indeed is how it is, Lacan tells us, because of the fact that where he is represented, he is absent. The reason why Lacan focuses on the discourse of the master 
is because it's the discourse of the master that emerges from this bumper sticker about how signifiers work. It's a bumper sticker that first emerges most powerfully in the subversion of the subject essay. So there you're in the early 60s. Here we are in the early 70s and Lacan is still bandying this bumper sticker around, this saying. A signifier is what represents a subject to another signifier. You know what we've done with this in 16 and 17. I'm not trying to do something new with this. Well, maybe one little thing new. You know, I can't help it. I gotta try something, you know. I gotta take some chances in this motherfucker. Listen, though, what we have here with this bumper sticker, as you know, is the foundation of the discourse of the master. The way that we write this bumper sticker topologically, topographically, is as follows. Get another sheet of paper, draw again two horizontal lines looking just like this. The signifier, the first signifier in this question is an S1. The signifier that represents the subject, the subject is the barred subject. And the signifier that represents the subject to another signifier, this other signifier being S2. So the way you write that is S1 goes above the first line. There's your first signifier. And there's an arrow pointed to S2, which is written above the second line. And then beneath the S1 in the first line is the barred subject. And what that tells us is that the signifier, S1, is what represents the subject, the barred subject in the lower left, to another signifier. And it looks like this. Barred subject in the lower left, S1 in the upper left, S2 in the upper right. This is the rudiment that got Lacan through Seminar 16, and at the start of Seminar 17, as we saw, he says, you know what, why don't we just add a little A here? He almost throws it out like, we got to find a place for this thing. Now in 16, little A is kind of floating around as this index or measure, as we've discussed, and I think it's doing great work there. In fact, I'd say that Seminar 16, we see Objea doing more work than it has done in Lacan's thought to date. I know that's an argument. Some people are going to say, no, nah, man, Seminar 10, anxiety. Come on, not without an object. Let's talk about this. Nah, man. 16 is where Objea really starts to do something. And you know where I think it starts to work. It starts to work around this notion of the grello, the sleigh bell, this image that pops in Chapter 15 of Seminar 16. And it totally inverts, as you've heard me say, the basic model for Objea that we oftentimes hear discussed. It's that from Lacan's seminar on the symposium, right? It's from the symposium where Socrates is this crusty old box inside which there is a shiny agalma, right? You've heard everybody and their mother pop off about this agalma on the inside and there's your obje on, there's a crusty box in the exterior. Okay, fine. But in seminar 16, as Lacan's thought has developed, the agalma is different. The image becomes one of a shiny sleigh bell, as you've heard me say in our lectures on seminar 16. Notice the difference here. The shiny exterior surface contains a little piece of shit that rattles around inside, a piece of iron if you enjoy tickling the inner ears of shrimps, as Lacan apparently does and mentions himself in, uh, in one of the seminars of this period. There is also this image that it could be a rock, a piece of rice. It's waste. It's a piece of a pot. It's detritus. That is Obja. It is not the shiny, brilliant thing inside the crusty box. It's the crusty piece of shit rattling around in the shiny thing in whose mirrored surface we run the risk of losing sight of all this. 
and reflections of ourselves. Now, I don't want to rehash all that. You can go back and check out our lecture on that chapter in Seminar 16. I believe it's chapter 15. The point I want to make here is that at the start of Seminar 17, Lacan is saying, okay, where are we going to put this A? I want to put it somewhere. And he says, oh, you know, building on my bumper sticker, we got this great place for it. We'll just put it right down here in the lower right-hand quadrant. That's where he wants to put this thing. OJ ah figures down here and gives him this opportunity to talk about surplus enjoyment, another key conceptual through line from seminar 16, 17, and right up here to the start of 18, is surplus enjoyment. We've talked a lot about this in our previous two series. We'll see how much we need to bring back up and pursue further in this series. I haven't read seminar 18. I'm working through this with you all. But here we have developed from the bumper sticker that the signifier is what represents the subject to another signifier, the discourse of the master. This is the structure of the discourse of the master, where in the upper left you have S1 with an arrow pointing to S2, obj on the lower right, and the barred subject in the lower left. This is where Lacan lavishes all of his attention. The S1 is a position of mastery in the position of agent. The S2 is the position of knowledge in that of the other. Objet A is the object or opportunity for surplus enjoyment that is produced when the master commands the slave, the other, to mobilize their knowledge, their know-how, toward the production of an artifact for the master's consumption. You heard me with the example. The Lord commands the bondsman to bake him a cake. S1 is the position of the command. S2 is the position of knowledge of baking, in this case. And objet A is the cake that the master then gets to annihilate, right? This is where Lacan is beginning Seminar 18. He's not starting with a general theory of discourse as we just worked out. He's starting with a particular focus on the discourse of the master. And the reason why that is, I suspect, is that three pages into this thing, really the second substantive page in Seminar 18, is him queuing up this signifier representing a subject for another signifier. And that is the very origin of the discourse of the master because the topography that results from that bumper sticker becomes the foundational ingredients in the discourse of the master. So Lacan's really connected to the discourse of the master. And what you've heard me say in this opening lecture, which is wild and woolly in its own right, don't get me wrong, I know what's happening in here. What Lacan is here adding to that is something that may not have been as clear in Seminar 17. It's right here in the second paragraph in Seminar 18. He's saying, what I mean when I say the reverse side of psychoanalysis, the other side of psychoanalysis, is that the other side of psychoanalysis is the discourse of the master. If you got a Mobius strip, the so-called flip side of the discourse of the analyst is the discourse of the master. Now, if it's a Mobius strip, you know they occupy the same surface. And the difference between them is one that Lacan describes in the second paragraph of Seminar 18 as a torsion. It's a torsion. It's a twist that gives you the reverse side of psychoanalysis. The other side of psychoanalysis of the analytic discourse is not an opposition. It is not an antinomy, you've heard me say. It is instead a torsion, like that which produces a Mobius strip. So whenever Lacan talks about the discourse of the master, you have to know that he's dealing with it on a Mobius strip that always reveals something about the discourse of the analyst. Now, we're not there yet. We're not ready to fuck around with all this stuff. We started to do this work in Seminar 17. We'll see if we get opportunities to continue it here in Seminar 18. The point I want to make is that the bumper sticker in question throughout these seminars pops up again here at the start of 18, which brings Lacan once more to the discourse of the master. But notice what he's doing that's different here. What he's emphasizing is that where the signifier points to another signifier 
is a field of sociolinguistic activity where the subject is not. This is indeed how it is, Lacan says at the start of 18. Because of the fact that where he is represented, he is absent. At the level of discourse, where the subject is represented, the subject himself as an embodied being, as a locus that has received the mark of the signifier, remember, he ain't. And that's the dilemma of barred subjectivity, as you've heard me say from the start of our series lectures on Lacan forward. The barred subject, in its most basic form, is split between the sociolinguistic fact of grammatical subjectivity and the bioanimalistic truth of embodiment, of enunciating subjectivity. The living individual is the enunciating living being that receives the mark of signification through processes known as socialization, civilization, castration, symbolic alienation, call it whatever the fuck you want, child development, if you really need that. The body receives the mark of society and as such also finds representation in the field of society known as the symbolic, the field of language. And as a result, is always torn between these two worlds. I'm at once a linguistic being walking around the post office, trafficking through Instagram. My bank is also where I live, but only at the level of a signifier, at the level of, an, of a bank account number. The federal government knows me very well. I'm there often, but only as a social security number. You see? The city and county of San Francisco knows me well, but only as Samuel Michael McCormick, resident at XYZ property in the mission in San Francisco, blah, blah, blah. They know me at the level of the signifier. I, however, only have one body that I know of. It can only be in one place at one time. I am not physically at the post office right now. I am not in City Hall right now in San Francisco. I am not in Instagram right now, nor are you, nor will you ever be. This is Lacan's basic point here. And he's saying that you see this very well displayed in the discourse of the master, where you have the barred subject down here, and this field of language use where the barred subject ain't. Now, I think that's a little sloppy of him to say, because if I were going to say it, I'd say instead that the barred subject has his foot in both camps, has his finger in both pies, or maybe two fingers, two pies, rather than, yeah, okay, you get the idea. But I get the point that he's making here. And it is a point that is important for us at the start of Seminar 18. Why? Because the S1 and the S2 in the top part of the discourse of the master, the discourse that emerges from Lacan's understanding of the signifier as that which represents the subject to another signifier, that level is the level of semblance. That is where the semblance is. Let's check some passages. You've been listening to me for a minute. Let's see what Lacan has to say about all this. The semblance is at the top, at the level of these signifiers, these S1s and these S2s. And I'm looking at some pages here that might help us. In the PDF that we are working with, which I have numbered from 1 to, I don't know, 200, however long these, this document is, I'm looking at page 8, which is in chapter 1. And one of the things he says is that the semblance is the signifier in itself. It's toward the bottom of the page if you want to track it down, or you can just listen. The semblance is the signifier in itself. We're moving fast. I'm just sharing with you some passages to get us going here. There is no semblance of discourse, Lacan goes on to say on page 10, which really starts cutting to the bone of what he thinks he's doing with this title. There is no semblance of discourse. Everything that is discourse can only present itself as semblance. So you can't talk about a semblance of discourse 
because all discourse is, is a semblance. And that's why Lacan wants to ask the question is, could we even think of a discourse that might not be a semblance? In other words, a discourse that might not be wholly, exclusively encompassed by the field of signifying articulation. That's the question here at the start. There is no semblance of discourse because discourse is a semblance, which is why it's important to ask if we could even imagine, arrive at, hell, if we're lucky, discover a discourse that would be not in the field of semblance, but somewhere else. You heard me say it. It's a real discourse. There is no semblance of discourse. Everything that is discourse can only present itself as semblance in the field of signifiers. Discourses can only present themselves in and as signifiers, which here Lacan is equating to semblance. Whether he sticks with that or not, we'll see. We're early in this seminar. And nothing is built on it that it is not at the basis of this something that is called signifier. Which, in the light in which I put it forward for you today, is identical to the status as such of the semblance. Page 10, opening chapter of seminar 18. Semblance equals signifier equals the top part of the foundational discourse known as the master that Lacan develops from his theory of the signifier. There you have it. It's our first step, maybe even our second if you count that radiophony riff at the start of this talk. It's our first step toward the title of this seminar. And as you've started reading this, as I'm sure you've realized, Lacan is hot on this title. He wants to like explain why he's doing what he's doing in his fancy title. So we're following his lead. That's what we're doing here. I want to call your attention, though, to one more passage with regard to the semblance and signifier. It's in the second chapter, in the page number in our PDF that would be page 20. It's a couple paragraphs, two or three paragraphs, into chapter 2. And he's riffing on the semblance again. And he goes through four of his discourses, arriving at the master. This place, which in a way is sensitive... That of the top left. So here he's referring to the top left quadrant of the discourse of the master, which is where that S1 appears. That S1 that commands and expects the world to obey. This top left, for those who were there and who still remember, this place which is here occupied in the discourse of the master by the signifier as master S1. This place, still not designated, I am designating by its name, by the name that it deserves. It is very precisely the place of the semblance. Now that's crucial here. This upper left hand quadrant in the discourse of the master, in the position of agency, is properly the semblance. This is where Lacan is focused in these opening chapters in Seminar 18. Now, why this matters is because there's this very odd moment in Seminar 17. And I didn't discover this years ago when I first stumbled into Seminar 17. It was one of the first seminars I read, probably maybe like you as well. And I didn't catch this, but on my recent pass-through, I did catch it. And it's this moment where Lacan says that because the discourse of the master is built from this bumper sticker about how signifiers work, there's something about its terms that tinge all the other discourses. Now, what I mean by that is that if you look at what Lacan is doing with his broad theory of discourse, the one that we worked out, where you have an agent addressing an other and something produced by that address. And then in the lower left-hand position, you have the truth of that agency, its condition of possibility. Lacan wants to say that whatever you put in the position of agent here will be tinged with a kind of mastery. So in the discourse of the university, which we've been discussing, there's a mastery of knowledge that the university professor assumes when they speak in certain ways. 
there is, and you can you could fill it out for each of the discourses. We have neither time nor desire to go into each and every one of them, but the logic holds throughout. You work it out, holler at me if you think that this is mistaken and I'll gladly correct. But the way that we're reading this is, agents are always positions of quasi-mastery. The other in question, whether it is a master, <laughs> a university, or a hysteric, doesn't matter who the other is, they will always be tinged with knowledge. There will, also, there will always be a stain of S2 that is still there in the position of the other. Now, you heard me work this out in 17, and I'm moving quick with it, on the assumption that you can always go back and review this section of the lectures. In the field of production, there will always be an element of surplus enjoyment, represented in the master's discourse with this objet a. The reason why this is important is because it tells us that whatever is produced by the address of the masterful agent to the knowledgeable other. Whatever is produced will be an object and an opportunity for the surplus enjoyment of whoever it was who played the part of that agent. This is asking a lot. Not so much for people who are watching this lecture, because I'm holding up the diagrams and you can see them all. But hot damn, if you're just trying to listen to this thing, it's kind of crazy, right? You need your eyes and your ears to make sense of Lacan's theory of discourse, which is why I'm not just making a podcast here. I'm recording audio and visually so that you can see how this stuff is playing out and in ways that I think are fairly accessible here. In the position of truth, the same logic holds. We saw in the discourse of the master that in the position of truth is the barred subject. Whatever is in the position of truth in any of the other discourses will be the truth, subjective, typically unconscious, not always, but typically, of that agent. It will be the unconscious cause of the effect that is the willful agent in the upper left-hand quadrant of any given discourse. And that's really important here. Truth is cause in Lacan's theory of discourse. An agent is effect of that cause. And if you want to really work this through the discourse of the master, look at what you have. Here is the unconscious truth that is one's barred subjectivity that the master cannot bear. That's an unconscious truth. Here in S1, what else do you see but the ego at work? What else do you see but semblance. Now, I don't know if Lacan is working with the Heideggerian notion of semblance here from Heidegger's mid-20s thought. I can't imagine he's unaware of this. He had read Being in Time. A semblance, shine, is not an appearance, erscheinung. And neither of these are phenomena either. Heidegger is very careful to distinguish a semblance from an appearance. A semblance is something that appears to be something that it is not. So when you, for instance, to jump to Descartes, because this is kind of an opening riff in our seminar, and you know it's fun to jump around with this shit. So when Descartes talks about taking a stick and poking it in clear water, and it looks like the stick is broken, you can do this. You've probably done this before. Maybe your kids do this. Maybe you remember doing this as a kid. You take a stick and you poke it in clear water, and it looks like the stick is broken. And then you pull the stick out, and you're like, oh my God, the stick is not broken. When the stick looks like it's broken in the water, that is a semblance, in the Heideggerian sense, because it is an image that purports to be something that is not, in fact, true. The stick, in fact, is not broken. It's an optical illusion. And that's what makes it a semblance. Now, I'm not getting the vibe from Lacan here that he's making great use of hermeneutic phenomenology as developed in Heidegger's mid-20s thought. But it's there. When we start thinking of the S1 and the position of the agent in the discourse of the master as the proper place for the semblance, because what else is the ego up to but this constant performance of something that it is not? Namely, someone who is omnipotent in the case of the master, omniscient in the case of the professor. 
what you see, in other words, in the position of the agent as an effect of some unconscious truth in any given discourse is an agent that plays the part of an ego that always is performing, pretending to be something that they are not, namely whole, complete, consistent, all-powerful, all-knowing. The master thinks that they speak and the world works. What a fucking delusion that is. Isn't this, though, how egos operate? They're always performing as though they have no unconscious, as though they are purely intentional, willful, I think, therefore, I am, motherfuckers. But that shit ain't the truth. You know it, and I know it. It doesn't take a Lacan to remind us that this shit ain't the truth. This is what it means to have a big ego. This is why having a big ego suggests insecurity. Because the ego is always only a semblance. It's a stick looking one way when in fact it is the other. That's important here. Lacan even has this bit in Seminar 17 where he says, the agent is what falls from truth. In this case, it falls up. The effect of truth is an agency that comes to us as a semblance. This is the first start. It's the reason why Lacan is moving with the discourse of the master, and it's what he wants to really work on here. He's more concerned, in other words, with what's happening on the left side of his topography of discourse, namely with that relationship between agents and truth at the very start of Seminar 18. The important part for us to note is that it's also here that we get a clue to what he's meaning by semblance in this discourse that might not be a semblance. If we're looking at a seminar titled On a Discourse That Might Not Be a Semblance, the first and foremost question is, what the fuck does he mean by semblance? It's a complicated term in Lacan's thought, but here we can just read what's in front of us, and what he's telling us is that that S1, that signifier of signifiers, in the upper left-hand quadrant of the discourse of the master is the proper place for semblance. And the point I want to make, again building on Lacan's work here, is that this is the field of signification, of signifying articulation, of all the differential relations that go into making a language. S1 and S2 are the minimum number of signifiers you can have and still have a language. They are the baseline, foundational, differential relation that gives us a Lacanian notion of language. My point is that in the discourse of the master, all that shit's happening above the bars. It's in the upper part of this discourse that we see the role of signification being pronounced the role of semblance playing out. And you know the reason why I want to emphasize this and why I'm hot on those passages in Lacan's work here that support it, because it allows us to ask the other question. If the upper part of any given discourse is the field of semblance, what is happening in the lower part of any given discourse? And what I would submit is that in the lower part of the discourse, what you see is not a field of signification, but a field of truth. What you see is a field of truth bound up with impotence, bound up with potential expressions of the real. Productions aside, it's that notion of truth in the lower left-hand quadrant of any given discourse that guides us into what I believe is going to be the centerpiece of Lacan's argument as it's shaping up here at the start of Seminar 18. What then do we know about this truth? This truth that is in the lower left-hand quadrant of any discourse, of Lacan's broad theory of discourse. This truth that is the cause of the effect known as agent, agency, the speaking subject. We have some passages that help us with this at the start of Seminar 18. Passages that recall earlier work that I'll be damn certain to bring to your attention as they come up. Start, for instance, 
with page eight of the PDF with which we're working. And you don't have to have the text to grasp what I'm about to say. The effect of truth is not a semblance. Interesting. Truth for Lacan is not a semblance. Its effects are not in the field of semblance. In other words, the effects of truth are not occurring in the upper part of discourse where you have S1s and S2s popping in the discourse of the master between agents and others. There's something else, something more artifactual happening in the field of truth. The effect of truth is not a semblance. So Lacan is starting to distinguish between semblance and truth. It's in order to show more clearly their relationship, I will suggest in a little while. But for now, I think it's important just to note this. The effect of truth is not a semblance. Now, what do we know at this point in Lacan's thought about truth? Well, if you've seen any of my recent lectures on this topic, which damn if I don't find hella frustrating, because this notion of truth, you know, I mean, I was brought up in the history of Western thought and the history of philosophy. And man, you know, people start talking about truth and my eyes just glaze over. Like, I just don't want shit to do with that. I just don't give a fuck. That's not what I'm talking about. It always just seems like one of these concepts that as soon as you hear it, you're just like, oh Lord, here we go. Right? You know that guy at the party? Start talking about truth. Oh Lord, here we go. Oh Lord, here he come. Here he come right now. Yeah. Let's not let that happen to us. Lacan, he could have chosen a different word. He chooses truth. Truth is an important one here. And it means something very specific for Lacan. Lacan's point about truth, very basically put here, at this stage in his thought, is that truth always has two parts. There's a part of truth that can be spoken and said, and a part of truth where only nothing can be said, if we could put it kind of technically there. A part of truth where discourse, he says in Seminar 17, is abolished. A part of truth where you can speak no further is another way to think this through. So truth is always only a half saying for Lacan. You hear people oftentimes riff about this with Lacan's statement that you could never tell the truth because it's too extensive and you'll die before you get a chance to pronounce its final aspect. Something along these lines, right? That's not really what he's up to with that statement, I believe. What's at stake there is the fact that whatever passes in the field of truth, which for Lacan is always going to be related, if not identical to the field of the unconscious, is that there's a part of it that can be spoken, that can't help but be spoken, but there's another part of it that cannot be spoken. And in fact, all of the greatest pronouncements of truth are the ones that say, beyond this point, I can speak no further. Here is the outer limit of my knowledge. It's a statement of limitation. It's a marking, a signposting of one's incapacity. It's a marking of the limit, extimate, within truth, beyond which you can speak no further. That's the great pronouncement of impossibility. It's impossible for me to go any further. That, my friends, is the name of the real, as we discussed in Seminar 17, but also here. What Lacan is doing with truth is connecting it to the real in this way. Truth's half sayings oftentimes are at their best when they speak into existence the fact that the other half of truth can't be said. And that puts it on a different terrain than that of semblance. You see? Page 8 is also good for a little one-liner. We've got the effect of truth that is not a semblance. And then you've got this great one-liner at the end of that paragraph. A discourse that might not be a semblance. Ha! In the meantime, there is no semblance of discourse. There's that passage. There is no meta-language to judge it. There is no other of the other. There is no true of the true. I throw that out there just so you can sit with it and also in hopes that maybe we might be able 
to run a thread from our work on seminar 14 through 16 through 17 right up into 18 around this notion of a discourse that might not be a semblance. Why there can be no semblance of discourse for the very same reason, my friends, that there can be no meta-language, no other of the other. And here Lacan is adding no true of the true. It's an enigma at this point, but one that I want to have on your uh, radar as well. The other thing that we know about truth here comes really at the end of chapter one. In fact, it's really right at the end where Lacan gets at his underlying point, his main point, the point that you see being played out in his theory of discourse. Truth for Lacan is always going to be tinged with the unconscious. When Lacan speaks of the truth, he is thinking of the unconscious, typically almost throughout his entire thought. I think that's safe to say. And so here what you have is an unconscious cause of the waking, willful asshole known as the ego or the agent. Truth as an unconscious cause, part of which can be spoken and part of which cannot be spoken. And you see this playing out in the penultimate paragraph of chapter 1 in Seminar 18. If something that is called the unconscious can be half said as a language structure. Half said puts you in the field of truth. The unconscious can be half said in slips, stutters, stammers, false starts, hesitations, repairs, awkward pauses. Choose your parapraxis. If something that is called the unconscious can be half said as a language structure, it is so that finally there can appear to us the relief of this effect of discourse that up to then appeared to us as impossible. There's that word again, namely surplus enjoying. I was a little surprised when he had surplus enjoying there. I was like, oh, snap, surplus enjoying. Okay, pause on that. We'll see if he makes good on it. Does that mean to follow one of my formula, Lacan continues, that insofar as it was impossible, it functioned as real? That sounds a little more in line here. The unconscious, as a statement of its own impossibility, does this mean that it now also functions as the real? I'm opening up the question because, in truth, nothing implies that the eruption of the discourse of the unconscious, however stammering it remains, implies anything whatsoever in what preceded it that was subjected to its structure. The discourse of the unconscious is an emerging. It is the emerging of a certain function of the signifier. And I think that's crucial here. Truth is somehow correlated in a contrary way, perhaps a torsive way, not unlike a Mobius strip, with semblance. Truth is not completely impervious to the signifier, especially when we think truth in the field of the unconscious. The unconscious is an effect of signification. We know this. What we're talking about here, when truth finds half-expression, when it states itself as impossible, what Lacan wants to mark this as is a certain function of the signifier. And I can't help but think if this might be a function of the signifier that puts us on the path to a discourse that might not be a semblance. That it existed up to then as a token is indeed the reason why I put it at the source of the semblance. Lacan ends that paragraph with. Now, I throw this out because we don't really know where this thing's going yet. We just started Seminar 18. This last paragraph, though, I would suggest it allows us to circle right back around to the key theme we've been working with here. This weird and wonky beginning that we made of this, not in Seminar 18, but in this radio address. But the consequences of its emerging is what ought to be introduced so that something may change which cannot change because it is not possible. 
It is on the contrary because a discourse is centered from its effects as impossible that it will have some chance of being a discourse that might not be a semblance. So the discourse that might not be a semblance is one whose effects would be impossible. Now what I would add is stated as such. It's by pursuing this, Lacan believes, that we might have some chance of discovering a discourse that might not be a semblance. And again, I want to suggest that this is exactly what he is popping with in radiophony when he discovers what he wants to say about the unconscious relative to the impossible. The unconscious one sees, and I'm reading the same passage with which we began, is only a metaphoric term designating the knowledge that only sustains itself in presenting itself as impossible so that from that it is confirmed as being real, to be understood as real discourse. Which begs that question, the key conceptual question at the start of 18, what is the relationship between truth and the real? Now, I think we have a clue to this relationship between truth and the real in the basic topography of discourse in Lacan's thought, where you have an agent addressing an other resulting in a production and there being some barrier between the truth that conditions the agent and that production. This barrier, this statement of impossibility where you mark your limits, where you can speak your limits, is rather important here as a presentation of the impossible. It puts us right on the verge of whatever Lacan is trying to cook up here in this stew of the unconscious, truth as half saying, and the real, not just as the impossible, but with this very crucial, specific use of the signifier as a pronouncement of the impossible. What interests Lacan here, in other words, is not the real, but its name.